couple of minutes. Um, Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, thank you for being here on time. I know others may be joining us, um, but we want to get started. So welcome to the first Healthcare Executive Group webinar of 2018. Our topic today is the 2018 HCEG Top 10 Healthcare Opportunities, Challenges, and Issues. I'm Kim Sinclair, the Chief Information Officer at Boston Medical Center Health Plan and the Chair of the Board of HCEG. I'm excited to be hosting this webinar as HCEG kicks off its 30th year. HCEG is a national network of healthcare executives and thought leaders with a vision to promote transformation and innovation in healthcare. HCE brings together thought leaders from across the healthcare industry, payers, providers, and sponsors to discuss strategic issues facing healthcare organizations today. Our mission is thought leadership through the collective contributions of a select network of healthcare executives and industry experts, while building relationships that provide critical access to market knowledge, resources, and strategies. Members of HCEG establish lifelong relationships that assist with current and future career development and advancement. We provide strategic development and mentor opportunities for member executives, and provide insight and knowledge to advance our member organizations. These are just a few examples of the value of HCEG. HCEG is fortunate to have the sponsors you see on this next slide. Our sponsors bring industry knowledge from many perspectives, and their work with payers and providers across the industry provide HCEG members access to a broad range of ideas, strategies, and experience. David Gallegos from Change Healthcare is one of our panelists today, and David is one of our longtime sponsors. We're also joined by Ferris Taylor, who has participated with HCEG for many years and many ways. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. David, let's start with you. Thank you, Kim. Good afternoon. I'm David Gallegos. I'm the Senior Vice President of Change Healthcare Consulting. And I have been in the industry for about 30 years, both on the payer and provider side, and of course, the vendor side of the business. I've been with Change Healthcare for about 10 years, and I've been part of the healthcare executive group for about 14. First as a CIO and, and a health plan executive, and then as a sponsor. I'm very happy to be with you here today and looking forward to the discussion. And welcome everyone. Uh, I too am pleased to be on the uh, the call today, the webinar. I also want to congratulate Kim Sinclair. She has uh, stepped up this year. January is her inaugural month as uh, our HCEG board chair. Uh, I occupied that seat last year. Uh, most recently was the chief operating officer of Arches Health Plan, one of the co-ops based here in Salt Lake City or based in Utah. Uh, but likewise, as as David, have about 30 years in healthcare, going back to the Harvard community, staff model HMO days, worked with partners, and spent about six years driving payer market strategy for Optum. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be panelists with Kim to discuss the HCG Top 10 today. Kim? Thank you. The, the, 20, 000, the 2018 HCEG Top 10 was compiled and ranked at our annual forum in Nashville this past September. We started with a list of about 30 critical issues to be considered, and 115 healthcare leaders attending the forum voted on this list. We then took the top 10 items and asked the same participants to rank the issues. What you see here is that final top 10 for 2018. This is the 13th year of the HCEG Top 10, identifying the most current pressing priorities facing our industry. The Top 10 serves as a framework for future discussions, monthly webinars, blog posts, and provides input into the agenda for our, for our HCEG Annual Forum. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll be taking questions from participants um, through the chat box, which we will um, respond to later in the hour. So please feel free to um, submit your questions. Um, David, as you look at the HCEG top 10 list for 2018, which three areas most interest you? Well, of course, they're all very interesting to me. Um, it, it's uh, been a very much a part of my, my life for the past few years, being involved in the healthcare executive group and obviously being part of the industry. But um, really, I think the top three uh, on the list are the top three for a reason. Uh, I look at these as the three pillars of value-based care. And as everyone on this phone probably knows, the industry really needs to, to shift to value-based care. But the reimbursements aspect of it, number three, is, is really just a part of it. Any value-based program needs to ensure that it's, that it's a win-win-win for the payer, for the provider, and for the member in order for it to be sustainable. Uh, so in order for it to be a win-win-win, you really need these three pillars. Yes, you need aligned financial incentives. You need to have strong payer and provider uh, integration or cooperation, really to create a true um, partnership between the, the caregiver and, and the payer. Um, but you also need to have the provider and the payer partner on fundamentally changing the way care is delivered. Um, uh, looking at integrated care teams, looking at whole person care, um, because what we're talking about here is really, in many cases, getting ahead of disease before it happens, ideally at least. Um, and when I look at healthcare, I look at it being more than just the absence of the disease. It's about preventing sickness. It's about overall well-being. And so really rethinking um, care so that you're uh, engaging the member, engaging the, um, the physicians um, throughout the entire um, process of a person's life um, is, is really a fundamental shift in, on how care is delivered. Um, you know, so this means addressing the medical, of course, but also the social, behavioral, financial uh, issues that go on in one's life and in their family, uh, and ultimately um, improving one's quality of, of life. Um, analytics, of course, is, is also on the top three. We, we need analytics to better understand what it is we're doing and, and learn from our interventions. So, um, again, these, these three are critical really for value-based healthcare and I think are appropriately at the top of the list. And uh, David, I have to um, say every time you and I talk about uh, the critical issues in healthcare, uh, it's really hard, uh, Kim, to answer your question as to what uh, three are the most interesting. I think, David, you've, you've hit on the top of the list and those have been in the top 10 uh, at various times, uh, especially last year, uh, value-based payments was number one and uh, uh, clinical data was number three on the top 10 list as our, our members selected them. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't think we should minimize the, the topic of costs in healthcare and that probably shows up in the top 10 most uh, significantly around uh, cost transparency. Uh, a, a, a lot of that discussion in, in the recent months has been around pharmacy costs, but it's not exclusive to that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of dimensions of, of the cost equation or the price equation that our, our healthcare consumers, our members and our patients 
just don't understand. It isn't consistent with what they experience in the other aspects of their life. And I think that takes me to, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the consumer discussion, and that's clearly one of my top three, but um, here in the top 10 is also uh, cybersecurity. And it's interesting to me that it too, like the data and analytics you mentioned, David, cuts across almost all of the issues. Um, uh, right after publishing uh, a month or so ago, the HCG top 10 for 2018, I, I and Juliana had a reporter interview and um, she was quite upset with me in the interview that cybersecurity wasn't number one. And uh, of course, I don't personally create the HCG top 10, it's our membership. But in fact, um, I had to agree with the reporter that if we can't assure the consumer of some sort of privacy around their, their data and some security there, uh, we, we have an issue. Cybersecurity was not on the top 10 list for many years, uh, going back three or four years ago, it uh, came up to the top of the list and we may talk about that later. But I, uh, I lumped these and my top three would have to include that bigger bucket of consumerism. Uh, you know, it's, it's on the list as total consumer health. It's on the list as, uh, uh mobile technologies. It shows up in the list again in terms of digital. Uh, health and um, uh, we can talk about each of them, but we are in a major transformation of, of healthcare from the consumer to uh, the the buyer being the employer to the consumer. So I would um, I would add those three, uh, Kim, to my to the list that David has pointed out. Thank you, Ferris. David, as Ferris talked about consumerism, um, it, it struck me that this has been a very major topic in healthcare over the last few years. It's been on our HCEG top 10 now for several years, um, but the topic means many different things to many people. Could you give us your perspective on consumerism and what you're seeing in the industry? Uh, absolutely. So fundamentally, I think con consumerism is about giving people what they want. Uh, and so at a high level, that means affordable, accessible, high quality care that improves their overall quality of life. Uh, you know, that's simplistic in some ways, but I think everyone could agree that that's what people want of healthcare. If you look at a more granular level, what consumers want and need um, vary significantly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so from that perspective, consumerism really needs to be about customization. Uh, if you look at Amazon, uh, the experience that uh, I might um, uh, experience um, is different than what you may experience on Amazon, for example, um, because they've done such a good job of customizing our individual pers you know, um, experiences on their site, as an example. So, so looking at consumer as customization uh, really changes the perspective of, of how healthcare should be delivered. Um, this means it needs to be delivered you know, the right service and or content at the right time and at the right place and by the right uh, caregiver. It's about 24-hour access to care. It's about multi-channel access to information and services. It's about providing relevant content to current or predicted life events. It's about customized care plans that take individual patients, specific conditions, genomic, social determinants, all into consideration. It's about empowering and enabling the consumers so they have the right amount of information to make the right decisions for their health, uh, you know, cost, quality, et cetera. Um, you know, this information needs to be delivered to them so they can make decisions from, you know, what to buy at the grocery store to what doctor to see at the clinic, from uh, what exercises they should be performing at the gym to, you know, what are the best hospitals to, to have a baby. Uh, really, it's about helping them along their journey from cradle to grave. It's about really partnering with your consumers throughout that unique and individualized journey. So um, that's what I that's what I think consumerism is about in healthcare. Thank you, David. That's very guess, helpful. Go ahead, Ferris. And, and David and Kim, I uh, you know it's hard to add to what you've described uh, without going into uh, a lot of the other uh, details around consumerism. AHIP in December. 
had their entire two or three day conference on consumer and digital health. But uh, in a nutshell, and I, I heard this uh, a few months ago, but it really stuck in my mind that health plans and providers and technology vendors in healthcare, uh, we really need to stop thinking like health plans and providers and, and technology vendors and start thinking like consumers. Uh, consumers right. don't look at healthcare as the only thing in their lives. Uh, it's our responsibility as healthcare stakeholders to find a way that our healthcare messages and our healthcare initiatives can fit into the life flow, as I would call it, of everything else that uh, our, our members and our patients are living with, their families, their work, their community, and, and, and like that. We need to weave into our initiatives uh, the day-to-day -day things that we know if consumers did them, and David, you, you, you mentioned the, the wellness activities and like that, but weave it into the things that they just naturally do. Um, it isn't hard because we're all consumers of healthcare, so we have a good perspective. Uh, as I said earlier, I think the world is changing from uh, the buyer of healthcare being the employers to the buyers of healthcare being consumers, possibly because of the ever uh, increasing costs uh, and uh, that consumers are finding they can't deal with our industry the way they do in other aspects of their lives. So uh, the challenge is for us. I, I would note, uh, and David, you track this as well, that consumerism um, was pretty much missing on our top 10 list 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but it's steadily gone up to the, uh, to the top 10 over the last few years. And so, Kim, I would say more than anything that consumerism is here to stay. And I would also say that I think we as an industry are still behind the consumer, uh, uh, slow to really uh, adapt to this transition in healthcare. And this will surely be a topic, Kim, for other webinars where we'll deal just specifically with that topic. Great, thank you. I think it definitely warrants its own webinar. Um, Ferris, you mentioned cybersecurity earlier. Um, as a CIO, cybersecurity is very near and dear to my heart. Um, in recent years, this has become a topic for the boardroom, not just CIOs and IT departments. Um, it seems each week there's a new threat, with the latest being the spectrum and meltdown vulnerabilities that everyone's seen in the news. Um, how are you seeing cybersecurity and cyber threats impact healthcare organizations beyond the tactical day-to-day -day threat prevention activities? It's a critical question, uh, Kim, and uh, I, I wished I could, in uh, a nutshell, give some silver bullets around uh, cybersecurity and how I see it and how I see us dealing with it. But uh, again, as I, I said, I think it's fundamental to our healthcare future. Um, it, um, it definitely is something that's on the minds of our consumers, uh, our members. Uh, we've had initiatives over the last five years uh, for more electronic medical records. Uh, we have regulatory things that are developing where uh, the lab companies now are required to give the uh, the, the patient access, electronic access to their, uh, their, their uh, medical data. So it's fundamental and we uh, need to innovate and improve cybersecurity in all of our healthcare processes. To me, cybersecurity really means giving people a confidence that their personal information won't be used in ways that that person doesn't want it to be used. So it ties back to consumerism in some some ways. Uh, historically, it ranked low in the HCG top 10. Um, I, I can drive this home with a personal example, not a personal example, but an example here in Utah. About three years ago, there was a baby that was born in the hospital that was uh, heroin addicted. And of course, the Department of Social Services immediately went to the home and removed the three children uh, from that home. The, the, the fundamental problem was that the mother of that heroin baby was not the mother in that home, and it took her three months to get her children back. It was a case of medical identity theft. 
uh, where the baby was born, the mother checked out, and uh, and you know we can relate to the personal impact that that lack of security around medical information caused for that family. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there will be more discussions. A couple years ago, we had an NTT uh, and HCG uh, webinar on cybersecurity. Uh, we will have more, uh, but this is an issue that is, uh, that is getting worse day by day. I don't know, David, what you would add to that, but uh, it is a critical issue. Well, I definitely feel feel for Kim um, because the world has definitely changed since I was CIO 10 years ago. So, Kim, hats off to you. I can't imagine Thank how you. you can sleep at night anymore. Um, you know, the world has gotten a lot smaller and technology a lot more complex um, over the past decade. And clearly, cyber terrorism is a big part and a growing concern that every organization needs to take seriously. Uh, but you need to keep in mind that the safest computer is one that's turned off and unplugged. And um, uh, clearly that's not very useful. Um, so we need to balance both security and usability. Uh, sharing of clinical information is going to be critical to our care model redesigns and our clinical collaboration. This data is also going to be important for us to leverage in uh, artificial intelligence to help us determine optimal courses of treatment. Um, in some cases, this information is even going to be uh, needed to um, to help us really define um, uh, how how whole populations are, are treated. So um, we we really need clinical information to fully transform the way care is delivered and to transform our industry. So given this, cybersecurity obviously needs to be um, and needs to get all the attention it deserves. Uh, we need to ensure that our important work um, is done securely and and protects the privacy of consumers. Um, I, I would note, and again, Kim, you can probably attest to this, that you know we we can have the most secure networks um, and the most secure buildings um, in the world, but you know security is only as as secure as its weakest link. And uh, um, I think the statistic is something in the 80 percentile range, where a lot of the intrusions that are that occur are really due through phishing and email scams. So we, you know, a lot of security has to do with training our own people. So we need to make sure our folks are aware um, that the prince um, from a country in Africa that's uh, sending you an email about the millions of dollars that you know you can gain by clicking this email um, is is unlikely true, um, and they should not click on that that attachment. Um, you know, there there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, it's something we have to fight. Um, but we have to do it knowing that um, without addressing this issue, our, our, our health care transformation will be stymied. Thank you, David. I definitely agree about the, um, the importance of awareness and training for our own staff. That's definitely a critical um, measure in securing our environments. Um, Ferris, earlier you mentioned costs, um, including pharmacy costs, which continue to rise and are a significant driver of healthcare costs. It's a topic that's constantly in the news. Um, many have probably seen the, the articles in the last week about nonprofits joining together to form their own pharmacy companies. What are your thoughts about what we can do as healthcare leaders about these pharmacy costs? And I, I will, for everyone's benefit, reference just last month uh, a webinar we had on pharmacy costs. Uh, Kim, uh, you can go to the hcg.org website to get that. One of our sponsors, uh, Cumberland Consulting, uh, had some experts on the, on the call to, uh, uh, to talk about specific actions. But uh, I just yesterday saw some statistics on pharmacy costs that uh, – uh, struck me uh, to the heart, and it was from the Healthcare Cost Institute uh, over the last four years. It was actually 2012 to 2016. And the cost of prescriptions in the marketplace had gone up by 25%, but the utilization of prescriptions had only gone up by 1.8%. And, and it wasn't just pharmacy costs. The ER uh, prices had gone up by 30, and visits had gone up by 
by by two percent. Um, uh, there is no silver bullet uh, or single solution. We hear the discussions about uh, CMS or Medicare, Medicaid uh, doing global negotiations on pharmacy costs. We we hear the uh, uh, the discussion that uh, consumers ought to be able to go uh, to Mexico or Canada to uh, to get the prescriptions. But I think uh, without a doubt, the topic needs detailed, deep discussion to be understood and explained and addressed. Uh, part of the issue is the way our system grew up around rebates, that uh, rebates were a very key issue when the employer was the purchaser to lower the overall cost of premiums. Uh, but today, the consumer or the employee selects their health plan. They basically make the decision on premium. But when they go to uh, get their prescriptions, uh, they don't get a benefit from the, the rebate, rebate or the actual purchase process. So uh, I think, once again, we haven't transitioned from the buyer being the employer to the consumer becoming more and more important in that uh, purchasing decision. Uh, I, as, as, as we discuss uh, pharmacy costs, uh, the other thing that I think uh, we need to recognize is that we we have a free market economy, uh, but um, industries have responsibilities uh, to govern themselves. And and I know some of the uh, bad players in the pharmacy industry are outside of the pharmacy uh, association, so it's hard to regulate them. But I I I view those key issues as the things that will help us start to address the pharmacy costs. David, I don't know about you, but uh, that's a start in the discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I really, you know, healthcare is such a unique industry. I mean, uh, I don't think there's anything like it. And again, everyone on the phone probably knows that. Um, you know, when I go into a grocery store and I have $10, and I, I look at product A, and it costs eight. And I look at product B, and it costs eight. Um, but I only have ten dollars. Um, I have to make a choice. Um, I have to make a choice: do I buy product A or do I buy product B? But uh, I mean, in healthcare, um, we can say we'll buy both. Now I only have ten. I don't have sixteen. But somehow, miraculously, um, often it's because somebody else's money. Um, I, I I buy sixteen dollars worth of of goods for 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 ten dollars, um, and and that doesn't work in a market economy um, when when there really is no balance between uh, um, a consumer's ability to pay and what the um, you know supplier wants to charge, um, we have a problem. Uh, when I look at you know the state we're in with pharmacy costs, it, it's to me it's entirely self-made. Um, we've created these regulations that allow schemes like pay to delay or evergreening that that really push generics um, out further um, in terms of their development. Um, we we create in a sense quasi monopolies. Um, we criminalize the ability to negotiate for larger population blocks. I mean, it seems it seems ridiculous um, <laughs> to me actually that you know drugs that were invented and manufactured here in the United States can often be purchased cheaper outside of our country. Um, and I do understand it's a complex issue. Um, I understand the FDA process is too long and development costs are high. And I do understand that some of the profits for the blockbuster drugs go to fund things like vaccines and other less profitable medicines. But, um, you know, and clearly drugs are very important. They reduce um, admissions. They reduce other high cost care. Um, and some of them, are, are miracles. They can literally cure diseases, um, cure the incurable. So I, I understand this is not a simple problem, um, uh, but if a drug costs a million dollars and a person can't afford it, is it really a miracle? Um, it, you know, and in any other market, if, if there was a product that nobody could afford, the supplier would price it differently. And, and that's what we have in our, our, our market. We have a problem where there's not that balance. Um, so we, we really need to figure this out um, as a country. Um, 
And I think the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry really needs to be a major part of the solution because uh, what the game they're playing is really short term because if they don't change, uh, then it will be changed for them. Um, so it will be interesting to see. But I, I do think that there is a wake-up call coming <laughs> and there will be kind of a, um, you know, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a you know, there'll be a time where the pharmaceuticals this this problem will be solved, whether it's with them or to them, um, sometime here soon. Thank and you, David, Dave. I want to uh, I want to add just uh, a, another challenge to all of us on the uh, phone today with respect to uh, not just pharmacy costs, but uh, the technology and the innovation in healthcare. And I will do that by going back to my. Uh, uh, coming out of uh, my undergraduate work as a nuclear engineer, nuclear physicist, and uh, being very adept with a, a slide rule, uh, it was the first year that uh, my MBA program required a hand calculator. And this was, a, this was an archaic calculator, nothing like the, uh, the HP calculators we have today. It was uh, uh, an inch or inch and a half thick and about four inches tall, and it had four functions, no memory. It was called a summit calculator and it cost $400, which in the early 70s was a lot of money. Um, there was healthcare technologies at the same time and I'll use the, the pacemaker and I don't know the exact price of a pacemaker in the early 70s as well. But over time, the quality and the functionality of hand calculators has expanded dramatically. And at the same time, the price has come down. And I, I don't really understand why the functionality of that $400 summit calculator today is a giveaway on an exhibit hall floor, the size of a business card with a, a solar panel in it that uh, recharges it, and it probably costs 13 cents, but a, a pacemaker now is 10, 15, $20,000. So the challenge that I put to everybody on the, the webinar today is, how do we get healthcare to a point, and it goes back to your value proposition, David, where quality and functionality improves dramatically without the cost going up exponentially? Um, and now I agree, a calculator will not kill somebody and a, and a, a faulty pacemaker may. So there's, there's a little different paradigm there, but we need to think differently about the value proposition in not just pharmacy costs, but everything else. Absolutely. Sorry, Kim. No, that's great. Thank you for rounding out our discussion um, with broader costs. Um, David, it wouldn't be a conversation about healthcare these days without mentioning healthcare reform and the uncertainty we experienced in 2017 with multiple attempts to repeal and replace the ACA. Um, what do you think is going to happen in 2018? Well, um, I, I have to admit I'm an eternal optimist. Um, I, um, I, I really think 2018 is going to be a watershed moment. Um, I believe we're going to make a lot of headway in a number of areas. Um, for one, I, I believe that Congress is going to act to stabilize the individual market so that we have a viable in, you know, individual market in 2019 and beyond. Um, I know, you know, given the status of Washington recently and the, um, and the shutdown last week, that, that seems hard to believe, but I, I doubt any politician wants to see people falling or, or losing health insurance come October, November of, next, uh, of this year. Um, so I, I do think one of the major things that will happen, and that will benefit everybody, um, health plans, providers, hospitals, community hospitals especially, and of course the citizens of our country. Um, I believe that Medicare Advantage plans will continue to demonstrate value and more beneficiaries will adopt those types of programs for their care, you know, instead of Medicare fee-for-service. I believe Medicaid expansion will continue, maybe taking a different approach, um, including having um, people of lower incomes buy in to Medicaid. I believe the push for value-based care, particularly through the use of bundled episode-based payments, will accelerate. I believe technology and care model redesign will enable more frictionless coordination, making our fragmented system uh, really feel a little more unified. Um, it won't be perfect, but a little more unified at least. I believe analytics and genomics will enable more personalized holistic care. 
I believe that diet and exercise and even meditation may be prescribed as frequently as pharmaceuticals, as people are beginning to talk about and realize the importance of, of really looking at the whole person. As Ferris talked about earlier, I mean, healthcare is, is a small part of our life. We go visit our doctor once or twice a year in some cases, and then the rest of the, of the time that we're not with the doctor, we're doing other stuff. You know, we're eating, we're drinking, we're exercising or sitting on the couch. And so, you know, the majority of our health, it really is impacted during the time we're not with our doctor. And, and, and that's becoming more acknowledged. And I think there'll be more of a push to try to, you know, nudge people along toward the right behaviors. Um, and then lastly, I, I really do believe the power of the consumer will be strengthened by new disruptive uh, entrants. And we're already seeing this with the um, CVS acquisition of Aetna, but I think obviously Amazon is is uh, hinting that they're going to get into this, and I think that's really going to change the dynamics. And I, I think that's just the beginning. Um, so to, to summarize, um, Kim, I'm, I'm super excited about the new year and all that we can make it. I do think that 2018 will be the year that we uh, change healthcare. Great, thank you. I'm, I love your optimism and I'm hopeful we'll see some of those changes in 2018. Ferris, do you have anything you'd like to share on your thoughts for 2018? Well, you, you notice I didn't jump right in right after David. I, uh, I've known David for a long time and, uh, and David, you, you continue to push the needle and, and uh, move the industry forward. But I, uh, I'm struggling with the uh, uh, with the re reform question, and it's interesting that, uh, of course, when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, and all the preparations leading up to 2014, uh, in our top 10, this regulatory environment and the uh, healthcare reform was up at the top of the HCG top 10 list. Uh, it moved down. And 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 off the list actually, and has come back on in this uh, this seventh place. And I'm I'm not trying to uh, give a lot of uh, priority to where this ranks in in the the list. But I I do uh, I do think we are struggling. And um, uh, I'll go back to my consumer con, uh, concept that I introduced, and that is that the consumers, as David has said, are also the voters. And uh, and yet, from a health plan and a provider organization, and even the technology uh, companies, uh, our sponsors and others, uh, need to to plan out uh, in the future. And the political posturing is making it very difficult to do that. Uh, uh, issues being uh, pushed out two or three weeks or one year or two years. And the only caution I'd put, David, around your, your optimism is that a radical change in the, uh, uh, the politi political leadership in D.C. could whipsaw us back in the other direction. And uh, that's... Uh, <clears throat> That's going to make it uh, less stable. I, I, I could quote uh, Ian Morrison uh, at an AHIP meeting when he, uh, his future, his view of 2018 and 19 was that we may be in for a lot more strategic chaos. Uh, as I look at the top 10, let me uh, also sort of look more broadly and say, yeah, healthcare reform is here on the top 10 list. But the majority of these issues that our HCG, HCG membership have identified are things that we as payers and providers and uh, technology developers can come together and solve outside of the beltway around uh, the District of Columbia. These are things that are fundamental. No matter what happens with healthcare reform, we need to address the opportunity with clinical and data analytics. We need to get upstream from the chronic illnesses with population health and our initiatives there. Without a doubt, we need to move from the volume-based uh, fee-for-service uh, 
payment system to um, a, a more value-based uh, set of relationships. And, and so the, the fundamentals, I think, are in the top 10. I, uh, I was hoping we would duck the uh, health care reform issue, Kim. Uh, it's a challenging one, uh, but um, uh, it's there in the top 10, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I don't know. You may have differing pers perspectives on reform as well, Kim. <laughs> um, I think it's challenging, and I think we're all anxious for, um, to, for things to settle down, the um, repeal and replace that's been on the table. and. Uh, there's been a lot of change in, in the ACA over the last year, and as a health plan, I, we're just looking for some some stability. So I'm looking forward to um, hoping that that will really be the case this year. So thank you both for your thoughts. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience, and I believe, Ferris, you may have been receiving some of those. Yes, and I thank Juliana uh, for tracking the chat, and uh, there, there are several here. Uh, one is fairly long, but let me take the first one that came in because I think it's uh, a, a good question. How do we get the provider community, providers and their staff, to embrace their role in consumerism, uh, including transparency? There is such a pushback from the provider community to engage patients in any sort of financial consideration. And, and I know, David, we didn't hear a lot uh, uh, from your perspective on, on, on that question, but uh, uh, Kim and, and David, uh, the question's there. How do we have well, providers I, I, to embrace that? Well, I, I think consumers need to demand it. I mean, I think, you know, I'll, I'll give you a personal example. I mean, when I first moved to Florida, about 14 years ago, I went through my provider directory like everybody else did, and I, you know, kind of randomly picked um, a PCP. Um, and uh, over the you know, few years of, of, you know, interacting with that physician, uh, I received, you know, what I would normally would receive, um, which was um, I would make an appointment, you know, a year or every 18 months because sometimes I would forget. Um, the doctor would walk in, you know, after the nurse and see me for 15 minutes, um, and that was it. Um, never did I get the follow-up call that I needed to show up. Never would they ask me about my eating habits or my drinking habits or, you know, um, anything uh, that was going on in my life. Um, uh, and, and they didn't have a medical record, electronic medical record. And so as I was, you know, thinking about this, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a consumer. Is this the type of care I want um, to purchase? So I made a decision that I was going to go out and interview PCPs. And I called a variety of PCPs, um, and, I, and I actually literally called one and said, you know, I want, I want to consult with you. I'm not, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, a checkup. I actually want to come in and talk with you about you being my PCP. And I interviewed them. I went in, and, and amazingly, <laughs> they actually sat down with me for about 45 minutes talking with me about the way they do business. And uh, at the end of it, they said, do you want to, you know, do you want me to look you over now that you're here? And I said, sure. Um, but they, you know, I didn't even leave the office without them signing me up for the electronic um, portal system. So they had me just sit down in the office because um, I was sold at that point. And, um, but, you know, th th that PCP has been my PCP for the past eight years. Um, you know, I get all my lab results um, online. I get alerts if anything comes up. They, they tell me when my screenings are available. Um, I get content pushed out to me that's relevant to my age um, and, and my family. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, consumers need to take charge. And when consumers do, the medical community will respond. Interesting, David. Maybe I'll move to Florida. That isn't the experience that, I'm, <laughs> that I've had in, in healthcare here, uh, although I, I think Utah has a high quality healthcare system. I would, I would add to what you've said, and I think there is an answer to the, uh, uh, the, the person that asked the question. I think there, we are approaching a tipping point that you alluded to, and that is that uh, we have to make that transition. Our, our traditional discounted fee-for-service contracting system has clauses in it that uh, uh, doctors uh, can't disclose their reimbursement rates. Uh, 
there is discussions that uh, I'm hearing at the state and at the federal level that challenge that. Uh, but more fundamentally, if we don't make that transition to uh, a new form of healthcare, uh, I, I think we'll be in trouble. I'm reminded of uh, Michael Crichton's uh, quote on, I think, page three or four of Lost World. Uh, where he said, extinction is the inevitable result of one of two things, too much change or not enough change. And I think we're in that, that, uh, that balancing act right now of, uh, of whether we, providers, payers, technology vendors, make that transition to the consumer-driven and consumer-engaged world or whether we uh, become a government-run system like uh, many of the other parts of the world. Um, Kim, I, I, I know you may have some thoughts on the, uh, yeah. the role so, of providers you negotiate with them, so please weigh in. Yeah, well, BMCHP serves a low-income population. So um, I think one area that you can focus on is the benefit that that really involving the member in consumer, the consumerism um, functions and the different capabilities and um, discussions um, for a provider really needs to come back to the benefit to a member's health. And with a low income population, um, social determinants of health have an even bigger impact. So um, making sure somebody, you know, is signed up for their medical record and their they're aware of when their next appointments are, or they know who to contact to, you know, get their transportation or um, automatic notifications about refills that are ready or whatever it is, um, um, understanding what their choices are, um, even with a Medicaid plan, what their choices are to go to different hospitals and different doctors. And I think if you can tie some of that back to the benefit to a patient's health, um, it, it might be a better starting point. Terrific. Um, there's there's several more questions. Uh, uh, Kim, when uh, time requires, you can cut off the questions. Uh, there's a series of questions from one of our listeners here uh, that I, I, I will break into a couple or three questions and, and read it as best I can. Isn't the current trial and error regulatory model of care and reimbursement that government applies getting in the way of true health care reform progress? Instead of the driver, shouldn't government be an active listener for the long-term policy need, uh, policies that are needed now? Um, how would you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, the only thing I would say is, is that uh, the, the government is probably the largest purchaser of healthcare services in our country, um, both at the state and federal level. Um, I don't think they can be passive. Um, and I think there's lots of vested interest, um, as we talked about earlier with, with pharmacy, but you know, there are a lot of other very, very powerful lobbies um, with this you know, uh, $3.5, $4 trillion business we're in. So um, I, I think the government has an active role to play, um, but it needs to be a responsible role, it needs to be a balanced role, um, and markets do have a role to play with this also. So. Um, Obviously, if it was easy, we would have figured it out already. But, um, but that's my that's what I think at first. And I see in in the question here something that has troubled me for the last four or five years. Uh, all of my previous years in healthcare, there was a process. Legislation, uh, legislators were elected. Legislation was passed. It was passed to regulators who drafted regulation, it went out for comments, a uh, 60-day comment period, it came back, uh, all comments were responded to and regulations were established. I don't know where that fell off the wagon, <laughs> but as this uh, listener has stated, it really has, the, the model has changed. And um, uh, hopefully at some point with a bit more stability, we'll get back to that more uh, long-term perspective, as the uh, the listener has asked here, a follow-on question there, and and Kim and David, this will be a good one for uh, especially you, Kim, wearing that hat right now. 
I see if cost becomes the major driver, then quality of care will undoubtedly suffer, much like it did with HMOs and fee-for-service as offices. Um, how does quality come into that cost equation, Kim and David? Well, I'd say that you can't have one without the other. So um, the definite focus, I think, and especially um, we're seeing that in Massachusetts with healthcare reform and, and moving to ACOs for Medicaid, um, that there is a balance of total cost of care as, as a significant driver. Um, but quality is equally important. And um, when you look at accountability scores for these ACOs, there's a percentage driven by total cost of care, but there's an even larger percentage driven by quality. So I, I think the, the drive needs to be overall, how do we reduce costs, but without making that, that mistake of letting, letting go of quality. I think you really do need to balance the two for this to be successful. And, and I, one of, one of my favorite, yeah, yeah, definitely. One of my favorite books of all time is by a guy named Phil Crosby. Um, I think it was written in 1978 um, or something crazy like that. Um, and uh, um, the book is called Quality is Free. And the general premise is, is that any effort driven toward improving the process and improving the outcome, in his case, he was talking about manufacturing, but um, any, any quality-oriented endeavor ultimately is going to be, is going to be value-added and ultimately is going to be less cost than the investment made. Um, so so my, I actually look at it a little bit differently. I think it has to be driven toward quality first. Um, uh, and then the cost will, um, will fall um, a, accordingly. And I think you know, the incentives have been totally misaligned. Um, I think when... Uh, you know, caregivers are responsible for the ultimate outcome first, um, and then they get paid for that outcome. Um, by very nature of their business, they're going to have to focus on, on quality. And so um, they, they'll be less likely um, because they're, you know, financially they'll be responsible for it, to letting someone get discharged before they're ready. Um, they will make sure there's appropriate supports um, outside of, of the hospital, for example. They'll make sure that there's appropriate follow-up visits and screenings done um, because at the end of the day, um, that quality care is going to drive their ability to make, uh, make money. So um, you know, I, I think they're tied together, but I think quality has to be first. I, uh, I've already talked about the, uh, my hand calculator uh, issue, and, and it does, uh, the, the traditional process is uh, quality improves and costs go down, and that's the, the definition of that value proposition. I, I think you've hit to the heart of it, both you, Kim, and David, that the, uh, the transition from uh, a fee-for-service to value-based care will naturally carry with it that quality component. I don't know, Kim, if we have time for one more question. It's a short one. The answer may not be short, but uh, uh, the question is, isn't fraud, waste, and abuse still an issue in healthcare? What are you seeing? Give me one answer first. <laughs> I would just shortly say yes, but... Um... David, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, yes. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest piece of that is probably the waste and abuse than the fraud. I mean, there's still fraud. Um, but, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, the waste and abuse, I think, is the larger piece of it simply because people are still, you know, providing defensive uh, medicine. They're, they're still uh, providing medicine, um, you know, maybe to... Uh, um, you know, meet those financial targets they have. Um, but again, I think value-based healthcare helps drive that out. Um, you might still have fraud, but the more and more you get away from fee-for-service uh, care, you know, reimbursements, the incentives for the types of, you know, abuses that have been taking place just go away. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, maybe I'm just too idealistic and I've been called worse, um, but I think value-based care really is the holy grail of, of, of healthcare. 
Yeah, and I, would and I add think to that, uh, Go ahead. Kim, just uh, just the, the the I mean, this is not a minor transformation that we're talking about from fee for service to value based uh, uh, reimbursement. Uh, and healthcare isn't the first industry that's had to do had to go through humongous transformations. I've used the analogy of the transportation industry a hundred years ago, moving from horse and buggy to automobiles. And in that process, in that transformation process, there wasn't a role for the buggy whip manufacturer. I think we're in the middle of this, what you call, David, a 10 or more year, 15 year, 20 year uh, transformation of healthcare. But uh, we're still driving around with our automobiles with buggy whips attached to them in, in healthcare. And those buggy whips are somebody's revenue but that waste and that duplication will come out. And I think the technology and the consumerism uh, are going to be drivers that will help us do that. I know we're running out of time, Kim, so yeah. I'll, I'll shut up at that point. <laughs> Thank you, Ferris. Um, to wrap up the meeting, um, payers and providers on the phone, if you aren't already a member organization of HCEG, uh, please consider joining us. Um, your registration would include two paid registrations to our annual forum, which will be in September, um, unlimited access to HCEG content and regional events. Um, and I'd also stress it's a great way to connect to other industry thought leaders in a really meaningful way. Um, and please save the date for our 2018 HCEG annual forum, which will be held September 12th to 14th in Minneapolis. Um, you can reach out to Juliana Ruiz if you're interested in HCEG and the forum. And lastly, um, please follow us. Um, and I want to thank David and Ferris for participating in the panel today and sharing their insights. And um, thank you to all of our participants. And I wish everyone Thanks a great to day. All of you. And Kim, we did have questions that came in that we didn't get to. Uh, we will step back, Julian and I can step back and, and uh, farm those out to the three of us and, and get some responses back. We appreciate everybody participating. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.